I have an admission. So over the last few years, I became very concerned about the concept of wine education. I started the WSET diploma um, to learn what the wine trade thought I ought to know. Particularly the British wine trade thought I, I needed to know, but I actually stopped it. Um, what I felt personally was that it was leading me down a path that was too well trodden. And um, that so many people had gone down it before, it was no longer that interesting. Uh, it was the uh, sanitized trek that you could go through as a tourist through the jungle. Uh, I personally felt that I wasn't learning as much as I should, uh, except for maybe the viticulture and vinification paper, which I learned a lot from, I must, I must really admit. And yet at the same time, I was forcing, being forced to learn stuff I didn't want to learn, which was how they thought I should take tasting notes. Now, this is a personal opinion, okay, but that's, that's where I came to it. To me, it was important that I either felt I was learning something in depth, really learning it. Uh, I'm still looking to do a, a proper wine tasting class. I'm sure there's people here who can take me through that. Um, uh, and either get really scientific, get to know what it was I was doing and tasting, because I never really understood. The, I mean, we're, all, we're a lot of people talking about it now. What is this minerality thing that pop, pops up in notes? Even I write it down, and I don't know what I'm writing. So I don't, I, that's why I get frustrated. Um, and others, um, the repeating things that have been said over and over again. I remember one of my classes started with, um, uh, it was a, fit, a little bit time ago, but said, you know, how Pinot Noir was never really going to grow anywhere outside of Burgundy. And even at the time, that was patently untrue, but it was still on the curriculum. So I got very excited when I started reading Clark Smith's book on postmodern winemaking. I have to admit that 80% of it passed right over my head in terms of technical knowledge, but I knew that what I was reading was interesting and it was stuff I should learn, I could learn, and that someone was at least thinking about this and making it available to learn, and I felt that that was now an option for me. Now, I might actually disagree with some of the stuff that's in there that was making me think and the stuff that was relevant, but at least I was thinking about it, and I didn't feel like it was just repeating it. So, um, what I, I think it was quite interesting, and I'm sure Clark will come up and tell you much more detail about what his approach, what is this postmodern winemaking that we're talking about, um, and how it applies to us as communicators, as well as his core audience, which is the winemaking uh, community. But I, I particularly appreciated his call for openness, transparency, and challenging our assumptions. As a communicator and as a marketer, I find that particularly exciting. So hopefully that's, this is, Clark's gonna come up and talk about that first. But I don't also believe that we all need to be scientific wine tasters with qualifications, otherwise I'd recommend that you all finish your degrees and apply for the MW program or something. Uh, I think that uh, the contrast to this rigorous approach is to have um, someone put his, literally, his finger up to the community that says this is what you're supposed to learn and says, I'll do something different. I'm going to do it my way. And, you know, when we think about a community and who the kind of people are who do that, there's some names that come right to the top of the list. And Arto, who's sitting in front here, is definitely one of the, the shining examples of, of the, uh, the, new, the new wave of communications, not just on blogs, but videos and TV and everything. Um, he, obviously, I don't know if you have come across his partnership, uh, Vini TV, which is now not, no longer active, but with, with Ilka, who was wanting to know when you're up on stage, he's going to probably start uh, sending out tweets. Um, but he's the wine personality that a lot of us, I think, would aspire to be, and he's now on, even on Finnish TV. And so he'll give us a contrasting perception of the other side of that coin. What is it when you object to that scientific and just say, look, I'm going to do something different? So I hope that these contrasting visions of flavor and how you um, figuratively and literally bring that to consumers and the trade uh, is exciting, challenging, you might not agree with everybody, and eye-opening. So, um, we'll let them come up, we'll get them to, take, uh, to talk, we'll see how it goes in terms of questions, maybe we'll try and do some questions for Clark specifically and Arto specifically and have a general discussion afterwards. But uh, let's kick off with Mr. Clark Smith. Well, I, I really have to, to uh, press that button a little bit. 
I, I think inadequately, but uh, attempt to express my thanks to, uh, to Ryan and to Rob and Gabriella for having me here. I think there's every prospect that uh, the following 30 minutes will be the most useful in my young life, uh, if I do my job properly. I just punch here. Um, just that way, the, the arrow. There. Oh, I got you. We'll start with a George Bernard Shaw quote. The single biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Uh, there's never been a time in the history of wine, in my view, uh, when we have a greater need for communicators. Uh, the problem is it's very difficult to communicate when you don't understand what's going on. That's really the reason I wrote my book. Uh, there's a growing disconnect between wine lovers and winemakers that's taking on the flavor of a bad marriage. Winemaking is a complex and highly technical craft, and winemakers have been very poor in communicating it, particularly lately, and they desperately need your help. For example, the distinction between vin de faux and vin de terroir does not exist. Wine does not make itself. It takes enormous effort for a winemaker to be invisible, and even more to do nothing. Benign neglect is not the high moral high ground. And the conversation is largely controlled today uh, by people that don't understand how winemaking is done. Uh, there are six causes. I think a perfect storm uh, that's come about in the last 20 years uh, that's caused this. Uh, one is the incredible increased competition uh, in the wine industry, particularly in uh, the United States. We now have over 100 times as many wineries as we did when I entered the industry. And so there's a great deal of confusion and a great deal of competition, so there's more and more secrecy about what's going on. I didn't even know what a non-disclosure agreement was when I, uh, 20 years ago, and now I've probably signed 5,000 of them. Um, the second thing is uh, an incredible technological revolution. I mean, winemaking technology. Uh, we have so many more new tools. I'm responsible for some of them. Uh, and uh, they're kind of weird, you know, sounding. And, and many winemakers are having trouble grasping exactly how the tools work themselves, let alone being uh, uh, trying to, to uh, communicate to wine lovers what they're exactly doing. Uh, and uh, partly because of uh, these new tools, uh, uh, they've partly brought about and certainly incurred simultaneously with a, with a huge paradigm shift in, in what wine actually is. We have a completely different notion of wine. We used to think it was a chemical solution. And now we find that the deviation from that theory is actually a pretty good working definition of quality. So that's very confusing, makes it more and more difficult for winemakers to communicate what they're doing when they only have a partial grasp of it. Uh, there's been a social revolution in ethics. Uh, people didn't used to care whether winemakers were giving them a straight Jesus, and now it's extremely important. And so uh, the communication that I do the minimum uh, comes off as disingenuous and it's uh, driving a wedge between us and the people that we hope to please. Uh, then in general, uh, in the last 20 years, we've had a great deal of, uh, of failure rate for new technologies in general. I mean, it's one thing for the, for the Russians to have their Chernobyl, but for heaven's sake, if, if, uh, if the Japanese can't control a nuclear reactor, where does that leave us? And so we have a growing distrust of technology, uh, GMOs, viruses, uh, spy or spying WMDs, uh, and so uh, science is not the sweetheart darling that it used to be. And finally, uh, critical wine review. Uh, you know, communicators used to be the friends of winemakers. I, mean, I had uh, 
I had one uh, writer that I mentioned in my book take great offense when I called him a friend of the wine industry. And I was hearkening back to the good old days. I'm not a friend of the wine industry. Uh, you know, that would be unprofessional. And so, uh, so now it's really turned into a blood sport. And there are certainly uh, a number of communicators that have uh, built their reputations on uh, destroying the intimate relationship between winemakers and wine lovers. So I wrote this book uh, to help bridge that gap and to try and return us to the intimate and loving relationship that we enjoyed when I first entered the industry in 1972. There have been enormous changes in winemaking technology, but winemakers have become timid. Uh, so the exuberant moral conversation on the web today is largely controlled by the ill-informed. It was my goal to articulate, not necessarily to advocate for new winemaking technologies, but to articulate them in plain English uh, and other issues of the day in order to facilitate a productive interaction. Uh, so, for example, uh, on uh, November uh, 9th and 10th, uh, we're bringing together 60 uh, top winemakers in uh, the United States, uh, and their whole job will be to rethink, uh, uh, to discuss uh, these new issues and uh, to rethink what, what winemaking actually is, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to tap into that uh, conference. Uh, I, I can't, uh, I, I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm gonna whip through a whole lot of uh, slides and more information than you'll probably be able to absorb and, and we will make the slides available to you later on but uh, just to give you some idea of the flavor of that conference uh, these are the issues we'll be discussing on day one I'll give you a, about three seconds to scan that I think I, I will mention that uh, the basis of our new understanding of wine, uh, and wine is really just, it's just cooking, you know. It's not really scientific. It's, uh, it's about giving human pleasure, sort of the ultimate slow food. And what we're discovering is just like in other forms of cooking, that the, uh, that wine is really, uh, it's more like a sauce uh, than soda pop. Uh, it's not in the solution where the soulfulness is, and so more, more like the way chocolate or Bernays sauce works, where the texture is critical to the soulfulness. And that's, a, that's a new thought, and everything else sort of builds on that. Uh, then day two, we'll be getting around to more philosophical issues. Um, Small wineries are, are, are really confused about how to live in today's world. They're no longer able to get their wines on the grocery shelves uh, because they've been pushed out by the large wineries. Uh, and they're really not sure what to do. They're trying to uh, develop intimate personal relationships through social media. Uh, and the pushback is hard to understand. Uh, first of all, they're really not sure what sort of wine they should be making. I keep telling my clients, uh, that uh, the key is that you, you don't have to please everybody, and if you did, you wouldn't be able to handle the demand. You only have to please about one thousandth of a percent of the market, but you have to please them very much uh, to develop a relationship. Uh, and a lot of that passion comes from the so-called natural wine consumer, but we can't figure out what they really want because I don't think they know what they want. And as I'll explain later, I don't think there actually is a natural wine movement. I think there are eight, and they don't want the same things. Uh, now, in particular, uh, this word manipulation comes up. I can't tell you how angry I am about this and how insulting it is. Winemakers really do need to start operating with more candor and I hope these explanations will, uh, will start to, uh, to build some trust, but calling, uh, well, I'll get to it in a minute. Um, so we're in the process of building a website 
uh, and you can read about it uh, on postmodernwinemaking.com. Um, so we worked with, uh, with some of the natural wine advocates to figure out what their concerns were, and the whole idea here is there's a QR code on the bottle uh, that you'll be able to go to this site and, uh, and uh, have uh, a full disclosure about uh, the practices that were used or not used in the making of a particular wine and discussion forums for each and every one of them uh, so that uh, uh, you can understand why these choices are being made. So these are vineyard practices. I can only give you just a second to look at these. There's, there's quite a few, about 30 uh, criteria altogether. I'm going to pick a few of these out to talk about. And finally, bottling choices. So of course, a wine label is way too small to be able to put all that information on. That's been one of the reasons that winemakers have had a hard time communicating these things. And now we have QR codes, uh, we'll be able to to go instantly to, uh, to a place where you can get all that information. Uh, and then you're going to have to think about how you actually feel about these specific practices. Now, the problem with the word manipulation is that it has two meanings. The first, treatment or operation with or as if by with the hands or by mechanical means, especially in a skillful manner, this is the essence of winemaking. And so being accused of uh, being manipulative uh, uh, just strikes us very odd. So we really think that the, the definition that we're really talking about is, is the second one uh, that has this flavor of deception in it. And so that's the point of the, of the full disclosure that we can actually tell you exactly what we're doing. Now listen to me, you bastards. <laughs> Calling a winemaker uh, manipulative is like, it's like calling your wife a whore because she's sleeping with you. It's what we're supposed to do. What in the world is the matter with you people? It's a bad marriage, and the way you heal a bad marriage is through openness and understanding and communication, and I hope you will help us. But winemakers cannot be expected to come clean if you whack them when they do. So here's a few controversial topics. Uh, yeast inoculation. Everybody seems to think that the best way to make wine is uh, not to use uh, uh, inoculation from yeast. Uh, are any of you aware that when you do that, when you allow natural yeast fermentation, that on the average you have 10 times the level of biogenic amines? Uh, these are allergens, of course. Are you aware that you also have 10 times uh, the level of uh, ethyl carbamate precursors, known carcinogen? Uh, also, in my opinion, uninoculated fermentations have the sameness to them. The bacterial uh, and, uh, and wild yeast that dominate those fermentations tend to give uh, an aromatic profile which is not always appropriate to the winemaker's task. Microoxygenation. You know, what could be more benign than the skilled use of allowing a wine to come into contact with oxygen. Uh, it improves lo longevity, aromatic integration, and replaces fining with animal products. I do a lot of microoxygenation. I don't apologize for it. Uh, alcohol adjustment uncouples the harvest maturity uh, decision from, from bricks. 
so that we can pick the grapes when they're ripe. Uh, it also can be used to fine tune the harmonic balance of a wine. Um, do you have a little water? Uh, the use of oak chips as opposed to new French oak barrels. I think the use of new French oak as a flavoring agent is not only silly, but environmentally reprehensible. We're cutting down 200-year-old trees in French forests that Napoleon planted to build a navy out of, and we're cutting them down four times as fast as we have to because we discard 75% of the wood because it can't be used to make a piece of fine oak furniture. Now, if you had a $1,400 desk, would you throw it in a wine tank to flavor the wine? It's ridiculous. And so oak chips are much more responsible. They work better. We can control the flavors of the wine. And it's better for the environment. Also, knocks about $10 a bottle off the price of the wine you're buying. Uh, whoops, did I miss one? I think I missed one. Nope, nope, it's good. So these are examples of conversations that you have not permitted us to have with you because you have made honesty too expensive. Um, there exists a greater diversity today than ever before in history, but that diversity is not on the grocer's shelf. You're not gonna find diversity at Safeway. You're gonna have to get in your Prius and go to those wineries. And I'm talking about 99% of wineries are not sold in stores. Uh, secondly, blaming the tools for sameness is really just silly. The, the reason that we have more, we have less diversity at the retail level is that we have more diversity to choose from. It's exactly like the music business. Uh, the AM dial is not really what's happening. Uh, the 100 point system is part of the blood sport of wine communication. Critics have shirked the task of cataloging the diversity that exists in wine and connecting consumers to it. So Rob's asked me to speak a little about that. Uh, first, I want to just whip through these eight constituencies that uh, make up the natural wine movement. Uh, and I believe that uh, because of this diversity within the movement, uh, its members simply don't concur on, on what's good and what's bad. Uh, so we have the non-interventionist that wants, that believes that the best wine makes itself, the environmentalist that wants to make wine sustainably, uh, the conventionalist uh, uses uh, their own ignorance as a yardstick of, of uh, what should be done. So, you know, environmentalists want to change the world. Uh, conventionalists want to keep it the way it is. They're both elements of the movement. They don't agree about anything. Uh, the traditionalist prefers time-tested methods, uh, but time-tested methods in the wine industry aren't always the most healthy. Uh, wine should be safe and wholesome. Uh, so, for example, the uh, non-interventionalist uh, non and the health-conscious person are uh, very much at odds around the manner of uh, yeast inoculation. Uh, the collector, justly so, is suspicious of experimental techniques because they don't know whether the wines will age properly. Uh, and then uh, the even more radical uh, authentic purist uh, believes there should be no additives at all and that, that there's a virtue in tasting the flaws in the wine. Uh, this has not turned into a really great economic prospect for wineries. Uh, so, I mean, I'd love it if the purists would actually go out and spend some money on these terrible wines, um, but they don't. Uh, and then, of course, the, what I call the terroiriste, who is passionate about unique flavors of place, as am I. So, uh, so I've got a table on the site, and what I've done is to score each of these eight uh, uh, constituencies for... Uh, oh, my animation is 
different here than yours. Well, that's okay. Uh, so let's, let's look at some of these. Yeah, yeah, it's just not doing what it's supposed to. Uh, so for example, uh, we already talked about yeast inoculation down there on the bottom. Uh, and you can see that I've given uh, positive scores for the conventionalist and negative scores for the health conscious and the traditionalist. Uh, in, uh, in the case of, uh, of sulfites, uh, I gave a, a, a high positive score for the collector and a negative score for the health conscious person. Uh, I don't actually think that sulfites have uh, uh, I don't, I don't believe there's such a thing as a sulfite allergy, and I don't think there are health consequences. But uh, on the other hand, sulfite-free wines can be very, very interesting. Uh, uh, extended hang time uh, is great for, uh, for the conventionalist to, to make the big, bold wines, but uh, makes really uh, short-lived wines with great impact and not much, uh, not much else. Uh, <laughs> well, there you are. That might be you. And so uh, the, the idea in the QR code is that you can choose, you can self-identify yourself as any one of these, but you'll also have the opportunity to uh, identify your own weightings in a ninth category that's just you. And so if you register on the site, uh, you'll be able to, to get a score for, uh, for any given wine based on your own uh, ethics and preferences. Okay, so here's your assignment. Uh, first of all, please report what you are tasting rather than your opinion about it. This is how we, this is how we uh, honor diversity, is to tell people what the, what the wine actually is rather than whether they're supposed to like it. Uh, secondly, do your homework and tell the real stories. Um, it's impossible to know everything in the wine industry, and I, and I beg you to choose your battles, uh, to, to uh, I, I love, I love Rob's uh, communication, uh, at the end it says, be worthy, uh, and, uh, so get good at something and talk about that, uh, and, uh, I would like to work with you to co-create a universal language for wine flavor and style. And I have some views on how it can be done. Um, so it's a five-step plan. The first thing is to agree on flavor terminology. I've uh, made some suggestions here. Uh, these are intensity or reductionist terms uh, that we can just rate, you know, a wine is either high acid or low acid. And, uh, this is sort of a boiled down aroma wheel kind of approach. Uh, I caution you that uh, intensity terms have very, very limited uh, use in uh, predicting consumer response. Uh, you know, people don't go, I'm going to go find the wine with the most strawberries. Uh, 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 and so I don't recommend any more granularity than this. Uh, there are specific flavor drivers of preference, uh, such as butter, vanilla, and Britannomyces. Some people love them, some people hate them, so we have a few drivers. But mostly, I think we need to rely on holistic terms, and here are some examples. I'm not going to go down the whole list, but if you just kind of glance at it, uh, we'd be rating each wine on, uh, for example, whether it's... Uh, whether its charm is inviting or aloof. I think that's much more relevant to uh, uh, consumer preference. So that's my suggestion. Uh, uh, so then, once we've agreed on a flavor terminology, we characterize the classic appellations in the, uh, in the US and some outliers like orange wines that wouldn't fit uh, into that part of the flavor space. And then we computer generate a flavor space. Uh, here's a simplified 2D uh, example flavor space. This isn't working. I'm dead. Hell. Wrong way. 
like so. Oh, there we go. Let's, let's, let's look, look at that some more. So I've just put Medivon, the Tanats down here, and the Mosul's up there, so the whole thing sort of makes sense. And you have the soft reds up there and, and, the, and the sophisticated reds down here. And, uh, it would look something like that only in 24 dimensions. Uh, so then, communicate about it. Blog about the whole concept of, of uh, uh, local truth rather than universal truth. Uh, individual characteristics for particular types of wine rather than a global standard. Uh, once we've done all that, we can put it all on, on your uh, iPhone so that uh, the consumer could simply walk into a shop or a, a restaurant and uh, if the wine list has been uploaded, uh, they can just, all they have to do is say, well, I like this particular wine, and I'm going to say, uh, wines like that, Fred is going to call his crisp, dry whites, and he has this other wine that, that he uses as an anchor for his big, bold reds, uh, and then those, uh, those are used to construct uh, personal algorithms for that particular consumer that are anchored in the flavor space like that. And then we just look for wines that are uh, somewhere around there. And uh, that gives us the capability to uh, select recommendations from the wine list <coughs> or the uploaded inventory or even on the web in the whole world of wine. Uh, and of course, once we find the wine, there'll be access to peer reviews, winery stats and awards and whatnot. And finally, do, do, do never utter the word manipulation again, please, and make fun of people who do. Would you mind very much? Thank you so very much for your kind attention. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that. I think, uh, I think we got some interesting comments, and we'll follow up after this with some questions. So let's invite Arto up. Please come to the stage, Arto. I, I don't want to fight to break out, so we may keep you two separate after this um, second keynote. We'll see how that goes. But uh, at least they shook hands on the way up. <coughs> and on the way down, we'll see how it goes. Would you like these mics? Welcome, Arto. Thank you. So, powerful words from uh, Mr. Clark Smith. And uh, I have to say that's very super cool. It's interesting that uh, though uh, you're addressing the, the whole thing from a winemaker's point of view, I'm actually talking about wine communicator's point of view. We are basically bo uh, both mapping the same thing, which is transfer transformation. I'd say adjusting to transformation. So, dear friends, I think all of us here have uh, experienced the same thing. Uh, I'm sorry. A moment or period of time when we really uh, got knocked by wine. And to me, it happened 10 years ago, and since that, I've been a wine lover. Wine culture seemed very rich at the time, and the amount of options almost infinite. However, being who I am, I started to soon notice there was something peculiar about the substance I learned to love or to put it more exactly about the culture surrounding the wine. You see, when I read magazines and books about wine, I felt a bit like looking back in time. You know, I'm 34 years old. I grew up shooting zombies and watching Beavis and Butthead light their own farts on MTV. <laughs> so to me, wine seemed like a very serious thing. And back then, 10 years ago, I was uh, studying sociology in the university in Helsinki. And one time, while sitting on a lecture, I was uh, once again thinking more about drinking wine and actually listening to what the professor was talking about. But I happened to listen, and a uh, good thing that I did. The topic in hand was the time of modernity. 
And at that point, I realized that what he was actually talking about sounded rather familiar to me. Uh, I, rea I realized wine was kind of stuck in modernity, like the last bastion of that kind of mentality. So what do we actually mean by modern? Well, basically this. Yippee! Dirty kids, chimneys, puffing smoke, steam engines, and serious scientific people over there. So I learned that modernity was also a state of mind. It was about hierarchies, rules, regulations, and categorization. It's a bit like collecting all the butterflies and giving them names in Latin. So this was the modernity. And it was most of all being rational and putting things in order. To me, wine communication seemed categorical, rational, and serious. It was one, like a one huge vintage, vintage chart. So encounter with this kind of world was intriguing to me because, you see, my world actually looked more like this. So yes, this is, this is the postmodern. So postmodern was David Bowie gender blending. And it was sex pistols spitting on their audience or whatever that monster is doing with its tentacles over there. Uh, postmodern was nothing short of a revolution that happened in art, architecture, and pop culture alike. It was like a huge explosion that set repressed, repressed energy free. And this was basically the world I was born into already in the 70s. So this change for postmodern, it happened for various reasons, but essential is that people lost their faith in the rationality of men. I mean, two world wars demonstrated that being able to create rational order didn't actually make us smart enough to stop us killing from each other. So we, we need a postmodern to bring some irrational sense to our chaotic mind and to, to reflect our need to destroy the big modern stories about world being a place that actually makes a lot of sense. So I ask myself, this happened already in the 70s and 80s. How is it possible that this huge game changer in the culture had barely touched the wine culture? I mean, it's quite telling that this arbitrary number is still relevant in today's world of wine. To put it into perspective, can you imagine a fashion critic actually talking about the fashion of the fall 1855? And yet in wine, the prices of the current vintage of Bordeaux are still dependent on the division invented in that year. So, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the gap uh, between the two worlds was rather obvious. I mean, the general culture was going this way, like all this postmodern thing that, uh, you know, the truth itself is only a story. Uh, you know, but wine culture at the same time was actually going more towards this way. Hang on, there's a provocation coming. Woohoo! <laughs> so, <clears throat> we don't have to go too deep into this topic here, though, it is juicy. But uh, <clears throat> I do have to say that uh, if, if giving wine scores on numerical scale is, is quite a modern concept. I mean, you know, it's surely not the gender blending David Bowie. So, I guess we could argue that wine communication didn't really catch the train. But it is very important to ask ourselves, does any of this really matter? I mean, what's the harm if wine remains a bit conservative and old-fashioned in some senses? Sometimes old-fashioned can be very charming. Well, it turns out there are a few things we eventually have to deal with. You see, like everything, this modern mentality comes with a price. We need to take uh, a little leap back in history to understand actually what's the deal here. So, back in the dark period known as the medieval times, the biggest authority was God. So, coming to 18th century, people decided religion was no longer the thing, but the coolest thing was actually science. So, blind faith was replaced with rationality. And, of course, this was uh, mostly a very good thing. I mean, we wouldn't have invented railroads, electricity, or vaccination had we concentrated in praying instead of uh, producing miracles. But rationality, it's, it sounds like a very good idea, but there is a catch. Because in Europe, reason and emotion have been seen as opposites for quite a long time. It's like the heart versus mind thing we all know uh, living in Europe. 
So along comes this strange concept that emotions blur reasoning. So back in the day, women were considered lesser than men. So men were seen as rational people, and women were portrayed as being sentimental or even hysteric. So being emotional meant being irrational, which basically meant being unworthy. So hopefully you follow. So if a man wanted to be taken seriously, he had to dispel any irrationality from him, which basically meant he had to distance himself from his emotions. So this is how the culture of the modern expert came to be. The expert became like priests, but only scientifically minded. They became the keepers of knowledge, the ones with all the answers in the world. They were objective, rational, close to infallible, and serious. And this is also how experts became free of taste and smell. They lost their flavor. So while sitting at that lecture 10 years ago, I realized that many wine critics were actually following this path even still. They were informative, but not entertaining. Uh, they seemed to operate without passion and basically pretended to do science with their noses. It's necessarily not the best way to communicate, actually. But let's get our buddy Aristotle for, to point out why this modern way of thinking may actually have been a misstep. I mean, more than 2,000 years ago, before the modern times, he coined the three modes of persuasion that make communication effective. And, you know, people haven't really changed from that time. So I'll try to keep it nice and short, try to hang along. So if one of these three modes he coined is lacking, the audience will be less willing to follow the ideas of the speaker. So ethos is the first one. It's about who you are, your reputation and credibility. So in wine, it will go something like this. I'm a respected author on wine. Check out my resume. OK, this is probably not going the way it should go, but doesn't matter. Let's do it like this. So logos. Logos is about how much you know about the topic you claim to know about. For example, Monsignor Freelings Blatzen in Nache has a super terroir. Wow, <laughs> this guy's real, you know his shit. <laughs> but then we have the pathos. I'm sorry this is not working the way it was supposed to, but the last one, which basically uh, is all about how you engage and evoke em emotions in your audience, whether by speaking or writing. In modern wine communication, it would be, please, let's, get, no, let's not get sentimental here. Let's be rational. So we see that because of the nature of the modernity, one, has, uh, one, uh, one out of the three is neglected. Pathos is overlooked because engaging the audience through emotions is, in, in this modern mindset is something that will diminish authority that is based mostly on knowledge. So according to Aristotle, I have news, that's bullshit. Because <laughs> pathos is the social glue that has the capacity to make people engage and make connections. So, you know, pathos is the vivid language in use. It's the use of humor, the personal touch that makes the difference. It's about being interesting and entertaining, not just informative. So why do I think this is especially uh, important now, 2013, that we're here in Rioja, talking about uh, digital communication? Uh, it's because the world has changed dramatic, uh, dramatically, pretty much like yesterday. And one doesn't have to be a fortune teller to see that if we, if we hang on to the old, we risk of becoming irrelevant. The name of the game changer is easy to point out. It's Google. We're basically talking about information revolution. And Google has already made almost infinite amount of information available to us with a single click in any place at any time. And we have to remember it was invented just a few years back. So no one knows actually where this revolution is taking us. But it is definitely changing everything. Already we don't want to pay for news. And knowledge is becoming similar to the air we breathe. We take it for granted in good and bad. And when something is taken for granted, it starts to lose its value. So this is the reason why the time of the modern expert is about to end. Google will finish it unless we allow ourselves to change with the times. So, okay, if we accept, you don't have to, 
that the old school is broken. What should the new school look like? I mean, what should we do next? So the obvious choice would, would be to go postmodern with wine communication. But what would that look like? Well, friends, we don't actually have to speculate because I tried it out for you. So, Vini TV. Uh, some of you guys might have actually heard about it. Uh, Robert mentioned it. And uh, it was a guerrilla wine media. I found it together with my colleague Ilka Siren back in 2009. So the idea of Vini TV was very simple. To drink lots of wine and have fun while at it. We basically wanted to bring wine into the sphere of pop culture from, uh, from the higher spheres of culture. And to, to me it was clear we, what we were doing was actually very postmodern. So we wanted to emphasize the form over substance, which was one of these big differences between modern and postmodern. So I guess you could say we wanted to paint the wine culture with bright colors. So no wonder the show was at its best quite irrational and totally shallow. So, to follow the recipe, for example, uh, here's the American porn star Nikki Benz. Uh, we made an interview with her and, of course, talked only about wine. <laughs> it was quite funny, I mean, it's, it, it was like a distorted version of a real interview because we were, of course, very serious. <laughs> and, and she liked champagne and Merlot, by the way. Uh, you know, we were talking about Merlot and at next sentence we were talking about intercourse. So, you know, if, of course it wasn't really about wine. We just wanted to see how champagne and tits go together. And I, I can tell you it's quite a magic combo. I mean, definitely works. So the point, if there ever was one, was to broaden the horizons of wine culture by breaking, breaking the taboos. And uh, though it may be offensive to some, uh, imaginary like this, has the capacity to broaden uh, the way we see things. So we did quite a lot of things. We were matching habanero chili with some expensive grower champagne. It was a really bad gompo. We have a snowy picnic with uh, frozen wine. We were also sabering bottles of fizz with snowboards and we had a rubber duck there in the corner. She was the official wine critic of the show. We, we named her chances out of love. And admittedly, we, we didn't take the topic too seriously, but uh, funnily enough, concentrated more on the low quality of the show. Uh, I think it's quite telling that uh, when our site was attacked by spam bots, we were actually happy about having thousands of Viagra ads on our site. But friends, <clears throat> time to be honest, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we ended Vini TV. It was utter crap. <laughs> it had no meaning whatsoever. I mean, it almost killed the meaning of wine communication, you know. To me, so it was obvious we had to finish it. I mean, it was just way too postmodern. So to me, it seemed, you know, it, it couldn't survive a minute longer. So here we are, if we, if, if, you know, we, we, two different worlds of wine, of communication. I mean, we have the modern and then we have the postmodern. And the serious modern one doesn't really seem to work because it relies too much on information and sort of kills the emotion. And then we have the postmodern world. You know, it's all about appearance and entertainment, but it's lacking substance content-wise. So where do we go from here? The obvious question is, how do we bring back the flavor to one communication? So it seems clear that we need to produce a new kind of volatile communication cocktail to rise up to the occasion. Sorry for my broken English, by the way. In short, I think we need to add value to our game in order to survive the tsunami started by Google. I mean, as a starting point, I think we need to do a couple of things. I think we need to ab abandon the concept of modern expertise, know-it-all type. And I think we need to have to emancipate ourselves uh, from the rational and overly serious no-flavor wine critic living inside most of us. I mean, hiding behind the illusion of objectivity is no longer necessary or preferable because it cripples the pathos, which is becoming once again extremely important because of the information revolution started by these digital changes in the landscape. So instead of portraying ourselves as bluntly objective, I think we should aim for sophisticated subjectivity. And I think Clark Smith was saying a bit similar argument about local truths. 
one that is based on vast amount of knowledge, preferably, but doesn't claim, uh, a claim on ultimate truth or end up suppressing emotions. So to make it a bit more tangible, I'll give you an example on how I've personally tried to tackle the issue in my own work. So here's my first book. It's called The License, License to Spill, and uh, don't worry, it's in Finnish, so you don't have to read it. <laughs> but I wrote it after Vini TV ended, and, and I, I sort of uh, was uh, puzzled about, you know, how, how should the postmodern one communication uh, make a synthesis with the modern one, and where should I go? Uh, in it, I wanted to write about Emilia Romana, uh, but I didn't want to dive in technical stuff first. Because, you know, all the vital information about it is already available to anyone with a computer and totally free of charge. And besides, I'm not the one who knows most about Emilia Romana. I'm sure there's one master of wine uh, who's a specialist in Emilia Romana. Or even better, someone actually living there, <laughs> knowing the stuff better than I do. So I can't actually compete with someone like that. So I have to add, add value uh, some other way. So why should people buy that book? So, I added the value by trying to build a shaky bridge between sharing information in a modern way, but while at it trying to entertain the reader in a postmodern way by adding subjectivity, humor, a bit of irrationality, nonsense, and my own personality to the text. So I told this true story of me trying to drive uh, this charity rally from Budapest to Bamako, Mali. So I had a Toyota Hilux, and it broke down in the middle of nowhere, and I got stuck there for days, and it was uh, January and I had mostly clothes more suitable for Africa, for Sahara, than Italian winter. And the, I was in a small village that was uh, all the time covered in a uh, fog, like the type you could actually cut with a knife. And there was only one restaurant that I was eating there a lot, basically every day, all the lunches. And the bright side was that they had uh, wine readily available. I mean, it was Italy. But, you know, in fact, they poured it for free. The bad side was that it was horrible, dirty Lambrusco. Absolutely horrible. So when you entered the place, already waiting for you in the table was a full bottle of this, uh, the lowest quality wine that they were actually able to give for free. Of course, uh, pink and sparkling, it seemed to mock my situation by its very existence, which is why I drank it by liters. So eventually I got to Africa, and it's a totally different story. Uh, but ever since Lambrusco has been to me a symbol of desperation, a symbol of being abandoned in the foggy hell called Emilia Romana. So if you read this kind of silly story in a book, the chances are that you've been entertained and that you'll remember the story next time you're in a wine shop and see a bottle of Lambrusco. Actually, it might be that you remember Lambrusco because of the story. So you may try to find hints of the story in the bottle. So though it will probably taste nice and summer-like to you, you've been emotion emotionally engaged with the style. So once engaged, the person can actually go to Google and find as much details about Lambrusco, about soil types, inclinations of vineyards, and whatever, et cetera, et cetera. And once again, someone uh, has already produced it. So that is, my friends, is ethos, pathos, and logos just organized in a new way. It is actually nothing new, just an old recipe, but one that has been adjusted to the changing world we are living in at the moment. So... There is a blue ocean out there full of people that have been grown with playing PlayStations and watching MTV. If we continue to communicate to them with like a, a postmodern explosion or Google never happened, we might see more and more people going for beer and booze in the future. So we must not let wait, uh, the weight of the long and precious tradition of wine to prevent us from evolving when it comes to wine communication. In a world of information overload, facts are no longer as valuable as they used to be. So my five, five cents about uh, bringing the flavor back would be concentrate on being inter interesting, sorry, interesting, not just informative. Instead of uh, only educating, go for infotainment. So educate yourself, but entertain the audience. And don't fear humor, play with wine. Let your passion show true. Don't fear, don't hide your emotions. And build insight from the information. Don't just produce raw data. Try to actually create something uh, unique out of it. And have an opinion. And just remember that you are the source of flavor in your wine communication. Kiitos. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, while you were talking about Arta, um, you were talking about bringing more flavor into the traditional and trying to combine those two. There was one name which popped into my head straight away, and Charles also said the same name, and I said it to Robert here, and he agreed. Somebody who's not really doing what he did. A few syllables, American, New Jersey, yeah. wine library, you know where I'm going, right? Gary Vaynerchuk? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about him and what he did? Does it fit in with what you are aiming for? Uh, I think Gary actually was like the pioneer of the whole uh, video blogging thing. And he just didn't to start, you know, blog about wine. He, he, he take it further. He brought the pop culture references, which is uh, quite Im important. But one thing about Gary we have to remember that he was very, very commercial. Uh, so it was not like journalistic approach. I'm not saying Vini TV was, but he was very commercial. So uh, I think that was uh, a, a very big part of the way he was doing it. But well, he's a respected figure. Uh, I'll share my view. Uh, I'm from Jersey myself, uh, and I actually aspire to be uh, basically a Gary Vaynerchuk only, only that knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and this, and that was what I think you should aspire to. You know, pick something and know what you're talking about, and then be Gary Vaynerchuk. Hello, um, I, I'd just like to comment on what um, Clark said in his talk about the disconnect between winemakers and, and wine lovers. Yeah, it and, sucks. Um, you said, and you spent about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, speaking about how confused small wineries were. You know, I'm, I'm a small winery. Uh -huh. I make uh, 10,000 bottles a year. Amy here is a small winery also. And Yes, I'm confused, but not for the reasons that, uh, that you mentioned. You know, I'm not confused about all the technical stuff because I know exactly what kind of wine I'm making and I know what interventions I'm making and what I'm not doing. And I believe uh, that my customers also know exactly what they're doing. Maybe the, the definition of natural wine I know is very hazy and everyone's got their own. But I believe that my customers know exactly what they're buying and what they're drinking, you know, because I, I have a website, I just do full disclosure and everything. What I'm confused about is is the fact that you've dedicated so much time, you know, coming, being a famous person as you are and be, coming from the industry, I've, you've dedicated so much time um, in your talk to talking about natural wines and you have all this list of eight things and, uh, and I believe that that's uh, it's just not true. Like, I'm a small winery and I'm a natural winemaker and I know lots of natural winemakers and uh, those things that you said, you know, um, they confuse me because they're not really the reality on the ground. It's like, um, it's like, you know, I don't want to say that you're fantasizing or anything, but it's it's really confusing to me because I don't understand where you're coming from and why you're saying these things and uh, and why they why they're so important to you or and to the industry. Um, well, that's why I'm confused. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's very, very common for winemakers to be defensive about their practices. I just hear this thing over and over and over again. I do the minimum. You know, there are people out there that, uh, you know, there are, there are evil winemakers, but I'm not one of them. Um, and so it's all, uh, rather than to embrace what we do and talk about what we do do, we disrespect ourselves. Uh, I, I saw, I went to see Oscar Gravner, what a wonderful man. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, he, he puts his, his grapes in the, in the quivers in the ground and walks away for six months. So that sure sounds like doing the minimum. Um, but he had a twinkle in his eye. And I, and I said, Yasko, I, uh, I, I understand that you're mostly having to control things in the vineyard because once the grapes are in the ground, there's not much you can do. Uh, and I, and I just, and I said, it's, it's a lot of work to do nothing, isn't it? And he just sort of winked at me. Uh, and, and so even he was not really willing to talk about what he was doing. It was more, I'm not doing anything. And I don't think it's true. I think his wines, uh, we tasted 22 wines from seven vintages, and they were all wonderful. I, I couldn't believe it. And 
And I don't think that happened by accident or by neglect. I think that's, that's correct, yeah. But don't you think that we're um, like big industrial corporate wineries are in one world with a oh, different yes. market, and we small Without question. Are, are in a different world. So I don't right. see why, why we have this uh, adversity to each other, you know? I, person, I know that there's natural winemakers who are aggressive and, uh, you know, and attack corporate wineries. I'm not like that personally, because I think live and let live. Sure. We, we have different markets, we have different styles Absolutely. of wine and stuff. Right, they're but, in the stores also, and we're not. Well, yeah. also, there's the, the, that's the same, you know, with corporate style, there's, uh, like yourself, you know, uh, you, you spent 10 minutes, 15 minutes sort of mocking and attacking uh, small wineries in your talk a little bit. What do bit, you think you know? so? Oh, laughing slightly, you know, like... Um, I thought know. I was attacking the bloggers. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I felt... I, Sorry, I, I guess I missed my shot. I, I felt kind of confused, you know, and I didn't know whether to, like what to think, you know? I was thinking, why is he saying yeah. this? This is not my case. It's not a, a lot of uh, other people, other, other small wineries case either. So I think, you know, live and let live is a, is a good policy. And sure. we, do, we do only represent like 0.000% of the market. So, so what is the, why, why are the corporate wineries so concerned and why are they dedicating so much time to, to uh, talking about us? about natural wine and stuff. You know? I was, What's the point? I, I completely agree with you that we don't have one in wine industry anymore, we have two. Uh, and you know, I think the numbers are something like uh, uh, about 1% of wineries are large corporate wineries and they completely dominate national distribution. Uh, it didn't used to be that way. I, when I, in 1975, when I was retailing wine, uh, we had 2,000 wines. It, we had every wine that was produced in the state of California right there. We're the Library of Congress for California wine. And today, that 1,000 wines wouldn't be even 1% of what's out there. Uh, so uh, I think that there is this continuing accusation that wine is becoming all the same. Uh, but that's only true in the stores. And it is, in fact, the job of the corporate winemaker to please the buyer at Safeway and to make wine within a very narrow focus. And if you just buy wine in stores, that's what you're gonna get. Uh, that, but it's a great skill to be able to do it. Um, uh, the, so this is 95% this is of the volume of wine, it's 1% of the labels, it's 1% of the winemakers, uh, and it's probably about 50% of the profit. So then the other wine industry, which is the other 50% of the profit, is composed of 99% of the winemakers, 99% of the wine labels, zero distribution, uh, all has to happen mano a mano, uh, and, and as I said, 50% of the profit. So, so their job is to not be like the wines at Safeway. It's the one thing they must not do, because why would anybody ever drive to your winery if they can get the same stuff right at the store? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think the small guys do more favors for the big guys than the other way around, but uh, it is complimentary and there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, I don't think that this conversation we just had is out there. I think people, uh, uh, many, many writers and critics have it that it's all one thing and it really is two very different uh, complimentary, you know, different markets, different goals. Yeah, I'm sorry, I really didn't mean to insult you. I, 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 I'm the Will Rogers of, of, of winemakers. I never met one I didn't like. <laughs> Critics are another matter. So, I have a question over here. Um, you're telling us that we should, you know, know something about something and we should be experts in that before we... Just a thought. You know, I think all of us are probably the experts of our own taste, right? And it sounds like, yes. to me, what... Ardo is saying is that in and of itself is a valid thing to express. And you're saying that perhaps it's not? I think you, you I, I think, I, I liked it when he said have an opinion. But know that it's an opinion. Uh, we have, I, I, I operate uh, uh, a website called uh, uh, Appalachian America. It has, a, it's 30,000 pages and it has every wine made in North America on it and we're going through and trying to characterize the 317 AVAs in the US and Canada and to say, well, you know, Sangiovese from Temecula is generally sort of like this. Uh, and it's completely descriptive. 
It's not that we're saying it's great. We're saying this is what it is, and if you like wine like that, there you go. And so we're trying to create a sort of an American flavor space. We have to throw critics off that panel because, for example, we were tasting Amador Zinfandel, which is sort of the Amarone of California. And, uh, uh, you know, these wines are long hang time, and they have a lot of alcohol, and they come right at you. Uh, and, you know, we've got critics on the panel that, that can't describe the wine. They can just say, this is shit, you know? And I say, but it's what it's supposed to be. We should be talking about what it is. And then we can say it's shit. Personally, I think it's shit, but that is, if you don't like wine like that, don't, don't buy Amador's Infidel because that's what it is. Uh, so this is what I mean, just to, to distinguish okay. description and, I, and I, opinion. And I think actually we share the same uh, idea that uh, objectivity might be a bit of an illusion, a bit of a myth, but from that, because of postmodernity, but be, from that you cannot actually say that uh, all the opinions would be equal. Uh, subjectivity ma might be mandatory, but doesn't mean that uh, uneducated uh, guess is as good as a professional yeah. uh, opinion. So that's why I use the word sophisticated subjectivity, which basically means know your stuff, but understand that palettes are so different. There is no singular truth out there. There's right. no 99 points. We used to have these movie critics, Siskel and Ebert, and they had very different tastes. And they would describe a movie and it would be either two thumbs up or one up and one down. And so part of it was that you got to know these guys and what they liked. Ebert was much more intellectual. Uh, he liked dramas and stuff and, 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 and uh, maybe, maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, one of them was very, uh, like the other liked comedies and, 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 and entertainment. And so, so it was useful to know that person's opinion. I think Robert Parker's a good example. People kind of know what his opinion is uh, and it would be good if he could do more describing the wine. Uh, his opinion maybe matters, but just to put that score on, it's just, it's just a Parker score. It doesn't tell you anything about what the wine is. So we, we need both. Clark, um, I loved your idea of mapping the flavor space. I um, yeah. thought it was very interesting. Yeah, um, we've got to do it. I'd like to ask Arto. Does that, you described the modern, which is about classifying and about uh, being a very, taking a very scientific, scientific approach. I, I'd interested to know what you th think of Clark's idea of mapping the flavor space. It sounds like a modern idea, but is there a postmodern use for it? Is, is, the, is, it does, is it something that you think could be useful in understanding flavors and communicating flavors to people? I think it might have value, and the value is once again subjective. To some people or some uh, part of the industry or, or wine making community or wine drinker community that might be very valuable. Uh, I, I get the idea but I don't think there is a contradiction between it being very modern as you say. It is about putting things in order and trying to find, trying to make harmony into what is actually quite chaotic. But the, it's the illusion of control that is to be feared. Yeah, I agree. R Ryan, is it possible to go back to a slide? Uh, well, the reason is uh, what I proposed was really mapping the emotion of the wine. Uh, you know, it's fine to say high acid, low acid, or how much sugar it has, but, but, but I think much more important are these, uh, these holistic descriptors, which are fundamentally emotional. It's the, you're describing the personality of the wine more than just how much strawberry it has. I think the biggest secret of the wine industry, we are all, we are all part of it, is yeah, actually not, the, not the fact that uh, just, uh, more than the, what wine actually tastes like, more important is actually when you have it, where you are at, when you drink it, and with whom. But you cannot sell uh, that. Terminology. This is information you cannot sell, so we have to sort of uh, <laughs> no, neglect like more than 50% of the pleasure of the subjective uh, experience and then concentrate on flavors and structures, and I totally get that. Okay. But I but think we should have right. open eyes what it's all about. D this is a very interesting uh, area of debate, because, Clark, you're talking about mapping the emotional reaction. Yeah, like that. Surely the definition of an emotional reaction is it, it is a subjective experience and uh, not an objective uh, oh measure boy, of experience. Oh, boy, you've fallen into my trap. Have I? OK. Uh, this is modern thinking. Uh, Subjective means, this is so important, it's just what he was saying. Subjective 
has, has, has in modern parlance has gotten a bad rap. All subjective means is that it's a human sense, right? So we have objective, that's true, and subjective, that's unknowable and bullshit. But that, the underlying assumption there is that you and I don't have any commonality, and that is not true. And if it were, you, you're in the wrong business. So subjectivity, I, 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 you got to come to my thing tomorrow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play with flavor with music. And, you, and I can tell you, because you're a human being, I can tell you that I can make you love or hate my Cabernet with my iPod. And it'll work because we have a strong, subjective, shared program in our DNA that, that allows us to tell whether a piano is tuned up. Nobody ever taught any of us that. We might not even know why we leave the bar, but we can tell harmony from dissonance. And, uh, and so, sure, these are human terms, but, uh, I mean, you know, if I were to say that, that the charm of a Beaujolais is that it's very inviting and it certainly isn't aloof, is there anyone here that would disagree with me? <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, this is more about the, uh, the stuff how he started to speak. Like, that you... Yeah, so maybe I'll just uh, go back to, to the start of your speech, Clark, which I really like because I think there's a lot of myth and a lot of bullshit that gets copied by a lot of writers that uh, is just not true, but that is maybe beneficial for a lot of wineries, uh, that, um, especially for the natural wine that sulfur is bad. Um, that's absolutely bullshit because sulfur is probably one of the most important ingredients to make amazing wine. Uh, so I, I think just go with Arto, know your stuff before you just copy something that some other people wrote. Uh, just my background, I'm a small winemaker as well. I have to deal a lot with uninformed, uneducated journalists that don't really listen to what you say, that just want to uh, let you know what they know and how they think you could make your job better, but they never even studied winemaking. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's a great idea to read this book because then you will learn about all the, the myths and all the misinformation about winemaking techniques and if they are good or bad for the wine. Um, and I think that was probably your most important point that you want to make, that the bloggers should actually know their stuff or just read about the real, the truth, how wine is made to, uh, before they judge or make an opinion. My, my favorite corollary of Murphy's Law is nothing is impossible for the man who doesn't have to do it himself. <laughs> I have a question for Arto. Um, I've lost count of the number of times that I go to a wine blog or a website and I read something like, this site is designed to make wine accessible. This site speaks to normal people. This is for you if you don't know anything about wine. We're demystifying wine. Um, <laughs> Isn't there a risk that if everyone is trying to go for this approach, very accessible, very easy, that we actually dumb down what is, in reality, a very rich and complex subject? Definitely. I think there is a risk of everybody become, be becoming uh, uh, populists. But the, the difference is that uh, back in the day when we didn't have books, all the knowledge was inside of our heads, so you needed your father to teach, teach to the son how to, the ropes. So then we get the printing press. And now we can actually learn from the books if we just find a bookstore, which we're not like every, in every place. So now we have Google. And now basically all the information is here. Mm. So what that actually means is that doesn't mean that we don't need uh, experts anymore. People who actually do the science get the facts straight. It just means we need them a lot less than before. So back in the day, if we needed uh, a thousand, uh, within 20 years, we probably need only 10. We need 10 hardcore scientists producing the facts. And once it's in, you know, in Google, if it's a valid source, I mean, there it is. So I, I, I may be exaggerating a little bit, but we need more uh, infotainment, not just the cold hard facts. Because once the cold hard facts have been produced, you know, then they, they are there for good. Uh, 
I think two very fascinating presentations, but listening to both of those and listening to all of the questions, I'm struck by the fact that we've talked about winemakers and we've talked about wine communicators and I haven't heard one mention of the consumer. And I think that consumers are like wines. Some of them actually choose the restaurant they're going to using something called the Michelin Guide, which isn't as successful as it was, but it's still pretty damn strong. And you don't get any description or anything else, you just get the number of stars. Other people will actually read a review, and some of the reviews are full of stories, and some of them will tell you exactly how the dishes are made, and you choose the reviewer you want to follow, and you find out whether he or she is informed or is just a great storyteller. And we had great storytellers in wine since the days of Hugh Johnson, who used to do anecdotes like yours, but in mm -hmm. a different way. And we have other people who want to get their information from their peers, through light travelocity and TripAdvisor and so on, and some of those peers are very well informed, but they're amateurs, and some aren't. But the consumers are coming at it from three or four or five different angles and choosing for themselves. And I think the danger is we are trying to come up with a way of talking to them. Gary Vaynerchuk works for a section. Oh, yes, and indeed. Hugh Johnson and, and, and Robert Parker does describe the wines at length. But actually, a lot of us don't like the way he describes them. We don't like the words he uses, but the people who read them probably do. And the other people who just want the points are happy with the points. If I, if I answer shortly, I think in the postmodern, uh, post postmodern reality, if I, if I should say, I think what we really need is uh, an infinite amount of different voices that are contradicting each other. And what we need to do is come down from the ivory tower and stop thinking about we are communicating from up there to someone who's consumer down there. It's a level field. So if I tell uh, bluntly that I, I dislike New Zealand Savino Blanc, which is in fact true, uh, <laughs> people will know from uh, one mile that, that that's, not the, that's not my guy. So I, I will not follow him. But then again, some people will agree and they will probably find out through that information, uh, you know, same, same kind of uh, pellets maybe. I completely agree. I, uh, I think Parker gets an awfully bad rap just because he's so powerful. Uh, and uh, we don't need less Robert Parker. We need, we need other voices uh, to be there. Um, I, I, I guess I didn't get the point across, but the real purpose of creating this flavor space is so that the consumer can have a, a multi-dimensional guide uh, to, uh, you know, I, I like this wine without having to pour through all the reviews that are always there on the internet, uh, but, but to, just to have reasonable suggestions, uh, sort of the way a sommelier would work with you, if there doesn't happen to be one present. Just, oh, could I ask a question? Yeah. Um, Clark, thank you very much. Thank you to both of you for the presentations. Um, but in, going back to your first the presentation you made, Clark, the, so in your book, there's no, no such thing as a manipulated wine. There's no such thing. As, as a what? As a manipulated wine. There's absolutely no such thing. No, there's, that's all there ever is. All wine is manipulated. Those aren't grapes in the glass. What's, uh, nobody seems to mind uh, that we use electricity in wineries. And you know, that changed everything. There are no traditional wines being made anymore. Nobody wants to give up their electric lights and their pumps and their... Uh, you, know, you know, and I mean, I refrigeration just, changed everything, stainless steel changed everything, but we have these things in our kitchens and so we're comfortable with them. Uh, and, and, and those are great manipulations. Right, no, no, I don't disagree with you, but I'm just saying that what the semantic of the word manipulate, yeah. um, in, in its absolute term, yeah, sure, you can argue that there is no such thing as a manipulated wine because you're manipulating. But that's very simplistic in my book because basically, if you know, like I know Bordeaux for many years, I've been covering it. I yeah. mean, there has been a movement where you had the garage movement that went too far. And they, they did 200% barrel aging, you know, they did yes. the, uh, I mean, right. so let's, let's call it something else. Let's call it sort of a no, wine no, that it's, has too it's much called, makeup. It's, too called, much. it's called bad cooking. Okay, well. Don't right, ask right. us not to cook. Okay. Just ask us to do it well and honestly. Okay. That is my entreaty. To okay. All well, it's just a question of semantics. Yeah. All right. it, well, but, but it is insulting and confusing to winemakers when you accuse them of manipulation. What you should do is say you didn't do a very good job making this wine. 
uh, you know, this, this oak is sticking out and it's getting in the way of what you have or, or whatever. But it's not the tools that are the problem, it's the skill and the palette and to a certain extent the market that they're trying to address. Write about that, just like a, just like a restaurant review. Uh, you know, I didn't like it. He did a terrible job. It's not that he was manipulating, it's just that he was bad at it. Anyway, that's my view. Uh, just a moment of shameless self-promotion. Anybody interested in uh. consumers, I'll be talking about that <laughs> tomorrow at 11.35. So yeah. Yeah. come join and get really Tim, Tim and I are, 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 are an interesting pair. Suck it uh, into that I, one. He, he likes to stress, and I think it's very important, all the ways in which we are different and, and how we have to make room for other people, you know, local truth. Uh, and I like to talk about the other side of the coin, which is the ways in which we're very much the same. And, uh, and both things are true. Um, about the whole manipulation thing, um, yeah. first of all, telling bloggers how they should do their work, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, you know, the idea of manipulation, I think, I agree with you, though, that Fundamentally, in winemaking, as in pretty much everybody, everything else, there should be an idea of say what you do and do what you say. Yes. But that's where I think there's manipulation. Uh, maybe it's the marketing department's doing it, but there's clearly is manipulation if people are pretending that they are doing wine that is yes. reflecting terroir, that is a great expression of this place and that place, or you know. Uh, evoking nature and all that, and what you're doing is doing a very constructed wine with a lot of interventions and additions. There's uh -huh. a degree at which this is no longer the expression that is said, and in that sense, I think there is manipulation in the world of winemaking if you're saying one thing and doing something else. Absolutely, but that's, I'm just saying it's a confusing and insulting word. We should come up with better ways to express what we're trying to say. You're talking about, about deception. So call it that. It's say, and I'm always telling my clients, you know, don't ever do anything that you're not proud of and you don't want to talk about. Because it's like really fun to talk about uh, the process of, of, of making wine and, and the ways that we do it and the things we decide to do and not do. You should never, you should never use a practice that you're not willing to, to talk about. And that, that is a problem. But on the other hand, uh, if you use the word manipulation, if you keep calling your wife a whore because she's sleeping with you, then she's not going to talk to you about her urges, you know? Uh, uh, it, we, it, we need an openness on your part and an acceptance. That's how we heal the bad marriage. And that the accusation of manipulation just ain't going to cut it. You get what I'm saying? Yes, I have, I have a couple of quick questions. Clark, uh, well, actually, for both of you. Uh, in your schema, you had mentioned, or you had listed uh, GMOs, genetically modified, modified organisms. There's hardly anything more postmodern, conceivably, than, than GMOs. Uh, you, take, you said that you think GMOs are postmodern? Oh, I don't, most definitely, I would argue. To take something from a bacteria to apply it to a plant matter. Well, I think they're pretty the, modern. The, the mixing and blending. Well, in any event, in any event, uh, I'd like your opinion, and perhaps Artem's as well, on the concept of of GMOs and its use in uh, winemaking, because it is being used in California, there's no, there's no prohibition. And secondly, uh, more expansively, one of the things that bothers me about wine analysis and, the, and these uh, whether holistic terms or whatnot is the complete absence of, of, uh, of any kind of reflection on the social position of a particular winery. There's nothing about its labor practice, there's nothing about its environmentalism, there's absolutely nothing about its uh, civic participation or about the kinds of grapes that it uses, whether it privileges, whether it's grubbed up a field blend or a rare or ancient grape and is preferred instead one that it knows to be easier to tend or much more agreeable and then shoot for a particular t a flavor profile and hope for the best. So th those kinds of social values are completely and totally absent in the vast majority of wine criticism and I would argue in, in the bulk of your analysis. That there's, not, there's nothing about labor relations, there's nothing about environmentalism, period. Well. Um it's an interesting idea, I hadn't thought of it, to put the social issues right in the flavor space. Um, I, I, my solution was the QR code and the full disclosure to facilitate that and identify what all the issues are, and many of those are social issues. I would argue that 
Human I would argue that the human imagination is sufficiently strong to be able to actually tease in, or even if it's a question of a fantastic element, to, to think those bucolic or industrial moments in the wine drinking experience itself. I don't find any way to divorce them. Just as you're sitting around with a bunch of friends, all of the personalities you know, the, or family, or you're doing participating in activity, it's all an extraordinary complex mm. melange, uh, uh, tapestry of activities that are going along, along with drinking. And this simply, the holistic terms, is once again another, another abstract and sclerotic kind of abbreviation of the real circumstances of, of, of drinking and participating you know, in a social world when you do. Good. Um, this is the ball that I was hoping to get rolling. To, you know, I've just sort of tossed out this idea and it's, it's kind of half-baked and just a way to get a discussion like this going and I hope you'll continue to participate in it. Well, I'm, I'm sort of leaving it to these guys to figure out how to organize that. Uh, Rob asked me to kind of put my two cents in to get the ball rolling and now it is, so thanks. All right, so we've had a pretty good debate. I don't see any more hands, and we're getting a little low on time, and some people are getting up, I assume, for bathroom breaks and other things. So, for the sake of our thirst for wine and stuff, um, I think we should move on and give uh, Arto and Clark a big round of applause. For <laughs>